recordings as well. So Samuel, um, there are uh, documents that have been uploaded on uh, Moodle. Um, would you like telling me the, um, a bit about what you've learned there or if you have, have you gone through them or uh, yeah, anything about it? Um, as of now, I've gone through some of them regarding the um, the uh, assessment criteria and um, the okay. uh, general overview, but I would honestly like a bit of a rundown of the um, of this particular module and what we're looking for in terms of the assignment. Okay, in terms of the assignment, yeah, um, <clears throat> that's okay. So if I just open up. This okay. Uh, this is the assignment. Please, I just want to open this up. So, at any point in time, you have any questions, please let me know. Um, yeah. So yeah. So it's leading change in. I'll make it a bit. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Just first yeah. one. Yeah. Thank you. So it's leading change in uh, health and social care. So uh, just a bit about, I'm stopping share right now. Uh, so what do you mean by change uh, generally? What have you understood by um, change? And if you're in an organization, how can you bring about change and how can you lead towards change? Any idea? Um, not quite, but I believe the change that we're looking for is essentially bringing new ideas to evolve the healthcare industry. Mm -hmm. That's what it I works. generally yeah. understand by change in a very simplistic term. Okay. So uh, in your organization, how can you bring about change? Any models that you've talk, uh, you've read about or any prerequisites that you've, talk, you've just come across? Just understanding what you have as a baseline and then we can go ahead from there. Um, as a baseline, no, I'm also basically manage, um, basically care packages. And I say maybe bringing change about can be from big to small. Mm -hmm. Essentially, for example, if you have, um, the, you could bring change about in terms of, um, employee morale and encourage okay. them so they can perform better, for example. Yeah. Mm hmm yeah, so change can be, <clears throat> sorry, anything. It could be big or small. So it doesn't have to be measured uh, in terms of the intensity. Obviously, uh, the small bits that you can change and then those can lead to a bigger change. So, and obviously we know that change can't happen overnight and there are certain barriers also, which we understand. And we'll talk about these and we'll talk about um, uh, bits about how, what are the barriers? And um, if we understand those barriers um, well, that is how we would be able to bring about change in a positive way. So yeah, I'll just share this with you. So this is the specification. I am, I'm not sure if you've um, had a look at this on Moodle. Oh yes, I had a um, yeah. look at it as on Moodle. So I'll yeah, like again. Yeah, that's okay. So. Yeah, so this a, a unit aims to develop your understanding. So there are certain theories of change uh, management. And how can you use these theories in uh, in order to bring about a change in wherever you are? Um, it doesn't matter if you're in healthcare, you might be in some other organization. So um, it's just those those important bits that we need to know. So why are theories important? Because theories have been tried and tested and well researched, so they just don't come uh, on their own. They 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 have good backing on of research, so that is why we strive for understanding theory so much. So this you will also explore different perspectives um, that affect change and social care uh, service quality and how it is evaluated to empower and involve the users of the service. So who are your service users? Can I ask you, who do you uh, have? Do you have patients as your service users? Um, 
most so clients. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so they they're your service users. So I I just wanted to understand if they're if they're patients that you have. What do you refer to them? What do you call them? Like if I work in the NHS, I'll call them um a patient. What do you call your service users? Um. We generally call them pa patients, but sometimes they're also referred to as clients because it's more so um, a bit more privatized. Okay, okay. I understand. Okay. That's why I'm being a bit careful because confidentiality. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. No, wherever <clears throat> there is an issue, please let me know and I'm, I'm okay. Uh, it's just an understanding of how you work in your organism. So your uh, learning outcomes would be to understand the perspectives of quality in health and social care services. So whatever we are doing, <clears throat> we're obtaining it um, like quality obviously um, comes first above quantity. So as I said, <coughs> change, and you said also that change doesn't have to be big or um, um, small. It's just the change that uh, you are so when do you want a change to happen? Um, again, a question from my side. Hmm. I assume that we want a change to happen before stagnancy sets in and causes a negative effect. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. Um, so you're uh, obviously you have certain assessment criteria and then you see that um, if there's any evaluation uh, uh, that you do and you have a poor quality um, or, or you have anything that is of poor quality <clears throat> that is where you want to bring about your change <clears throat> and then you're analyzing your methods of evaluating uh, health and social care quality of service provision <clears throat> there's certain external agencies that will be working and um, <clears throat> so any um, agencies that you can think of that are there to make standards, are they there to make, um, let's say, guidelines? Are you aware of any? <clears throat> um, I say probably the, well, you have to run me through. I don't want to accidentally. Give... Yeah, that's okay. <clears throat> that's the, uh, you have nice guidelines, for instance, that they uh, commonly, um, used the guidelines are very commonly used um the world health organization for instance it gives uh, for the entire globe gives uh, us recommendations and standards then you have certain other qualities um, controlling and quality maintaining standards we'll talk about all of those uh shortly and then uh, in this you have the indicative content would be uh so we'll talk about what stakeholders are and the different stakeholders. So um, in your instance, what stakeholders do you have? Like, obviously, you'll have your manager, you'll have your service users, as you said, you'll have um, the, the families of service users, you'll have multiple stakeholders, isn't it? So, yes. yeah, so here we'll, we'll, this is the first learning outcome that will be achieved. Uh, then the second is understanding the strategies in order to achieve quality in health care, um, health and social care services. So we're, uh, if we don't understand what strategies we are using, obviously the first instance, what we do, uh, the first and foremost thing what we do is um, analyzing our barriers so if we have an understanding of what barriers we have that is when we know that these are the barriers and they will definitely be there once we are trying to bring about change sometimes you might not have it in one form you might have it in another form but more or less organizations have <clears throat> similar sorts of barriers that's why we talk about how you analyze these barriers uh when you're delivering quality health and social care services so uh, yeah as i said the nice guidelines there's the king's fund quality measurement framework which has indicators for quality improvement outcomes and um, the different policies and then the factors that affect for uh, quality of care so different factors obviously you have the problem with um an organization is or i would say that 
the main uh, issue with organizations running an organization is that it's not just one uh, stakeholder, there are multiple stakeholders. So it's just not the family, um, the patients, let's say, uh, in my instance, if I can give you an example. Uh, it's, uh, I'm a teacher. So let's say I, I have stakeholders who are the students uh, and the rel uh, they're, they're all people who are related to the students. Um, and uh, if I'm working in, um, okay, so we have I have a line manager who's the stakeholder, but above that I have the manager who's the main the per the main person, and then I have the dean, and then I have multiple other organizations, the NHS that's working also together uh, with the university where I'm teaching. So there are different stakeholders that have different roles. So we'll understand <clears throat> what barriers there are in case of different stakeholders and how those barriers can be best analyzed in order to best re uh, reduce them if we are not able to completely remove them because these barriers will always remain there. But we improve our standards. We still uh, improve our standards regardless of the barrier. So then we'll talk about the third learning objective, uh, which is an understanding of the principles of change management in health and social care settings. So there's certain factors that drive change. Any idea what are the factors that drive change, Samuel? Um, outside of stakeholders, I'll say the general economy um, and as well um, innovation and evolution of technology. I think they change, they lead change um, in the healthcare industry, like as external factors. Yeah, and what internal factors do you think of? I'll say internal factors um, would have to be um, direct um, direction of leaders within the organization. For example, a CEO may decide to um, um, pivot their course of what they want to focus on. For example, they may want to um, focus on technological development or they may want to um, focus on um, research um, mm -hmm. to be able to understand patients and clients more um to match their needs mm -hmm. yeah they're perfectly um explained yes so we'll talk about certain uh factors that would drive this change uh certain external and internal triggers of in a change and innovation so the change in markets their economy that has um so what happened with COVID-19 uh the economy went crazy obviously the focus was now shifted from um, uh, treating or even prioritizing chronic diseases even if this so the most important chronic disease that was probably uh, they did not focus on was the mental health so while they were focusing on safe lives uh, mental health cases they 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 suddenly started rising, obviously because of isolation. So no one ever expected this to happen. So these are some barriers that have been identified. And then some barriers you don't, you can't really identify. So you still keep them in that place because you, you, you're done with COVID-19, but you can expect, um, God forbid, another, uh, another uh, spike in cases. And what do you do in those instances? So when now that you've had examples and you've had multiple researches, that is why research is so important. Now you understand that what could be the consequences. That's not <clears throat> uh, just uh, the death of the patient. That could be uh, crippling mental health disorders, mental disorders <clears throat> also that uh, emerged or surfaced because of <clears throat> this uh, pandemic, which we thought that would only lead to death. It did not lead to, <clears throat> sorry, it did not lead to death only, <clears throat> but it gave rise to several other conditions that we were not expecting. So those conditions, <clears throat> those expectations should be there. <clears throat> so we're trying to, we'll try to apply approaches to organizational change. How do changes in the organization happen? What's the principle of change? So we'll understand basic principles. Uh, systematic changes for the humans. Uh, from where do they start? We're talking about cultural aspects, uh, different individual focuses, and then we're talking about different approaches to organizational change. 
uh, in understanding what the principles are. This is our third uh, learning objective that should be covered. And then we'll be able to create a plan <clears throat> and implement effective change within a health and social care organization. So here, you will obviously have to develop a plan, a tool. So, and this will help you within your organization also uh, to assess and analyze what, what's happening wrong, what quality issues are there, uh, and you'll start analyzing them. That's the first step. And then you'll start assessing what or analyzing what barriers you would have uh, in order to bring about a change. And then after that, you will obviously uh, think about what tool you would use uh, to implement and manage these changes. So you'll be developing a plan to implement change in your organization. And then you'll talk about what quality is, um, what are the parameters of quality of care. So there's safety, effectiveness, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. Uh, if I can ask you, Samuel, what, uh, what do I mean by equality and what do I mean by equity? Um, equality is when you give out a equal amount of um, something to someone else to um, say you have three groups. Equality will be essentially giving um, an equal amount of resources to each person. And equity is essentially giving out a balanced amount to what that person needs in order to support themselves. So in equity, it will be, say a person actually needs more resources in order to, um, to thrive, they will be given more or less depending on the position that they're in. Yes, exactly. And what do you recommend? What do you, would you recommend equity or equality? <clears throat> mm -hmm. I'll say... I think equity is actually quite good. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so, yeah. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I think there's pros and cons to both. Yeah, and definitely. But in, yeah. And in leadership, you need to see a balance of what is what is um appropriate depending on the context. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, so obviously this change, whatever you're bringing, or quality of care, um, if it's if it's safe. That's the best. So sometimes we talk about uh, positive risk taking, for instance, for patients in which, for instance, there's a patient who's gone through a knee surgery or a hip surgery. I'm just giving an example. And you want that person to start walking on their own, uh, which will be a risk that they're going to take. But then it's a positive risk. And then you're considering that there are safety measures there. Um, um, and, and this obviously gives the patient um, autonomy gives them uh, a feeling of uh, in the, it increases their confidence in, the, in themselves and helps them in healing faster. Effectiveness, obviously, uh, it's measured again. And uh, whatever care you're providing, whether small or large, it should be effective. Patient centered, your yeah, that is the key thing in quality. So whatever you're doing, you're keeping it patient centered. You're thinking about talking, um, you're planning with them, uh, their, let's say, their uh, treatment regimes, you're, you're planning their uh, surgeries with them, but you're doing that with them knowing that these are what your plans are, but then first you would listen to what they want um, instead. So that is how it's patient-centered. Um, everything that happens is centered around them. But then you have to have a balance on, in that also, uh, considering that there's a patient who comes and says that they, they require antibiotics and you've had all the tests done and you think that they're not, uh, they're not the candidates for uh, giving antibiotics. So what do you do? Obviously, uh, it would be patient-centered. You would give, give them treatment, but not just for the sake of them um, being patient-centered, you can't just go ahead and give them what they want every time, so, or at any time, I would say. So it has to be, it has to be well um, organized in that way that whatever is best for them should be given to them. Uh, and that's what quality, uh, is, that's why quality is so important. And then we'll talk about uh, timely and efficient and equitable 
uh, care that we provide. External, uh, external and internal pr perspectives will be discussed. And then the fifth learning objective will be uh, to be able to analyze stakeholder responses to organizational change. So as we spoke about different organizations, they have, you have different stakeholders and um, obviously not all stakeholders will be on your uh, side. Obviously you'll have to have an understanding that there'll be resistance also uh, in terms of um, how, you uh, how you deal with bringing about change. So not every stakeholder will be willing to go about and have that change. So how do you analyze different stakeholders and uh, how do you assess that they would have this resist, they would in, uh, use that resistance to stop change from happening or they would want to, um, to bring about a change in the direction that they want on the aspects that they think are best. Obviously every stakeholder has several other stakeholders also. So you have to understand that it's, it's usually uh, it's very in um, the connections are so many that you can't actually uh, see it as a one way thing. It's multiple more stakeholders involved. So then we'll evaluate effectiveness of quality systems, policies and procedures. So we've talked about what policies and procedures, what organizations, some organizations that make policies and procedures. We are analyzing factors that influence the achievement of quality and health and social care provisions suggest ways in which health and safe uh, social care service could uh, improve quality of service provision. So these are all uh, the conflicts, the types of conflicts that we talk the, uh, about, the sources of conflicts, um, different, uh, different practical applications. We'll talk about different examples, how these conflicts could happen and how can they be best reduced. So now, uh, the assessment, obviously, uh, uh, you must achieve the learning outcomes. <clears throat> so there's several learning outcomes that you have. Uh, the first will be uh, the um, uh, um, like a presentation with speaker notes. And the second will be a report, a management plan, which will be 2,500 uh, words long. So is this document clear right now? Yes, it's very clear. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, any questions uh, regarding this document? Um, not really. I don't have any questions no. about it. I just wanted to ask that on mm -hmm. Moodle, the um first available module to do is this one, but it appears that this is meant to be a unit five module. Okay, it's a unit five module. But on Moodle, you're saying it's the first that's appearing. Yes. Okay, I can um, have a look at it and I can get back to you with the team. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just let you know. Uh, the second uh, thing that I'll share with you is, just give me a second. <clears throat> Okay, so this is for the assessment. Okay, so obviously uh, we've talked about, um, can you see my screen, sorry? Yes, I can see your screen. Yeah, thank you. So the unit uh, of, we've talked about, the, we'll talk about understanding the ease of change, uh, how they apply to uh, any organization. Uh, we've talked about um, the different learning objectives uh, and how will the assessment be carried out. So, um, and in your, um, obviously there's a PowerPoint presentation and then there's um, um, a plan that you have, a management plan that you have to develop and a report. But I would I would strongly recommend that some, that some students who um, who do very well in their writing, but um, there's uh, a lack of referencing there. So Howard referencing would be the standard that's shared on Moodle also. So that's in uh, that referencing would be in text also while you're writing. 
and it will be at the end also in the reference list. This is for both for the presentation as well as for the report. So just keep an eye on uh, that thing because um, you might their students do well in their um, general documents, but the referencing that is something that struggle with. So in the first task you're uh, presenting and you'll have notes also, it's a, pre it's a PowerPoint presentation uh, and you'll explain the ways quality can be evaluated, measured and maintained in health and social care. So <clears throat> how do different stakeholders contribute to this? So obviously, uh, you'll ha you have different stakeholders. You'll talk about external agencies. You'll talk about the service users. Uh, in your case, if they're patients, whoever they are. So uh, you will provide speaker notes at the end uh, of the session, and you'll have an executive summary uh, that will be there to support your presentation. So what is it that your presentation would have? It's explaining the uh, stakeholders' roles. So different stakeholders, obviously, <clears throat> we have different roles um, uh, in when it when you're considering quality and standards. Um, and how do you assess that? There, if if you would want to discuss even further, how would their roles be? Uh, um, how would you analyze their quality standards? Like, if do they have a way of analyzing their quality standards? What measures do they use? What regulations? do they use and if they have any barriers that they know of, uh, how do they analyze or how have they analyzed so it's something that you if you have an, a good understanding or a good grip on what is the stakeholder perspectives this is how you go about and so obviously then you have a, a patient let's say as your stakeholder or it's people who are related to your patient they're one of the main stakeholders so how is it that they see quality what is it that they expect as being of quality do they have any expectations do they have any barriers so these are some things that if you would analyze it would give uh, a, a good flavor of uh, and a, a good understanding of how stakeholders how their roles have been evolved and <clears throat> how do they consider or perceive quality and standards so obviously uh, there's quality and standards are measured in different ways. So for, if in, for instance, if it's an organization, they have standard measures of uh, assessing change or quality. <clears throat> but then your stakeholders, such as your patients or pa people who are associated with the patients, they don't have any standards. Obviously, they don't have any measured standards. They just have comparisons mostly. So how is it that these comparisons, how do they impact um, the change that you want to uh, bring about in health and social care. So you'll explore the role of agencies which are external in the setting and how would they uh, would you maintain standards, evaluate the impact of poor quality and standards on health and social care. So obviously it's a 15 uh, slide presentation. Uh, you would have to give bullets in it, but then if there's speaker notes that can give more elaboration on your points, uh, you cannot actually um, write down everything there. But if you have notes down uh, on your presentation, that would give more elaboration and more explanation into your bullet points that you're adding. And then you're analyzing methods for evaluating health and social care quality of service provision explaining ways in which quality can be measured. So there are different ways. We've talked about a bit about um, the guidelines, uh, the organizations that set up guidelines. You know a bit more about um, how, what are the ways in which uh, quality can be measured. And then we'll talk about evaluating approaches uh, to implementing quality systems and then Again, as we uh, as I mentioned earlier, that there's several barriers to delivering uh, quality health and social care services. So you'll analyze those barriers. Uh, obviously, once you've talked about stakeholders, that is when you uh, have their um, uh, their viewpoints, and then that that is how you understand that is from where that that come uh, that trickles down towards uh, understanding the barriers. So it's a 15 minute presentation uh, file uh, and it will be having um, references. 
So you should be able to write 500 words um, and supporting each slide. So this is with your speaker notes, obviously, at the end. So your references will be at the end and within the text also. Um, yeah, that's about the first part of this assignment. And then the second task is change management uh, plan and report as the <clears throat> it indicates itself. So you're talking about change. So um, uh, whatever we've um, sp spoken about, I've spoken about, um, like how do you analyze factors that drive change? Some of the factors that you this you yourself mentioned, uh, some theories of change management. So there's several theories. Um, if you want, I can go through them also with you. Um, yeah, and describe approaches, tools, and techniques that would support the change process. Explain the importance of effective change management for service provision. So at the end, so you're talking about all of these and it's a report, um, it's a plan and a report. And uh, it will be 2,500 words that will be excluding your, uh, your first, uh, your headings and your diagrams, your references, your TOCs, and your uh, appendices will be excluded from that. So whatever you have is here, it should be like a management plan and a report, so it should not be very descriptive. It should have all of these um, uh, in it. So, and then you're explaining the importance of effective change management for service provision. You're creating a plan. So you have to have several headings here and subheadings here also, because plans are mostly more, they're more succinct. <clears throat> but when there is a plan that requires more elaboration, for instance, if there are certain procedures that you have, uh, cert a certain policy that you want to implement, then with every policy, there are procedures that explain how uh, that plan is implemented. So what you can do is instead of writing down all the procedures there, you can just give them in the appendix to reduce your chances of going above your word count. And also because this is a lot to cover, so you would want to write um, something about all of these and still remain within your word count. So yeah, and then you'll assess um, selective uh, and ass um, you'll assess and select relevant tools and techniques that, that are there uh, already uh, re well researched in order to implement and manage change. So you've implemented change. How do you make that change sustainable? How do you make that change manageable? So that uh, that change is okay with all the other stakeholders that are involved. So you're developing a plan to implement a change in an organization. How plans are developed? How are they? You'll ha you'll have to look at how plans are developed in um, in other organizations, for examples. So and then you'll have to develop measures to monitor. So everything that uh, starts, like if you're starting a process, you'll have the different ways of monitoring and evaluation. Um, so you're what, seeing what progress is happening your, uh, when that change has been implemented, but you are foreseeing some things also, and you're, in, uh, you, you're using them in your, um, obviously in your barriers that you have these barriers that you foresee, and uh, these would be highlighted, these would be especially focused when you're monitoring and evaluating uh, any change uh, that's happening. So obviously monitoring is uh, on uh, a regular basis. Evaluation are midterm and uh, end of term, or you can have it on specified schedules, but it's not, um, it's not something that happens uh, every day. So it's monitoring that happens on a regular basis, more regular compared to evaluation. So you'll apply stakeholder analysis, this is another way to understand possible resistance to change. As I said, stakeholders, they're different stakeholders, so you'll uh, have to analyze uh, their uh, resistance to change in different ways. Um, critically appraise relevant strategies. Uh, this is to manage change, uh, resistance to change in different organizations. So then uh, you'll, if you research them, there's several ways um, uh, in which you manage resistance so in an, within an organization and how uh, how do you think that or how do you say that uh, 
um, so if, if it's a critical appraisal, obviously you'll have to have a critical analysis of how to manage resistance in several organizations. Once you've ha had an understanding of what resistance different organizations could come up with, then you'll evaluate uh, the effectiveness of quality systems, policies, and procedures, uh, analyze factors that are there to influence and achieve the achievement of quality. So again, external factors, internal factors, all of them will be there in your report. And you'll then at the end give ways in which you'll, uh, these are all recommendations uh, that could improve the quality of service um, of service provision. So um, I would recommend whenever you're writing down anything, like you're uh, starting um, your report, you should I ideally have this in your document. So this would not obviously um, be a part of your word count, but then this will give you a good yardstick to follow. And then this will give us understanding also that yes you have had a look at these these are there to guide you these have been there to guide you throughout your um assignment and um yeah and um it's something that's useful for you and for us as well so uh your you will be giving a presentation file with references speaker notes will be there worth 500 words and your management uh, plan and report will be uh 2500 word long and uh yeah so you should be able to use uh, uh, sources uh harvard references referencing style should be there uh within the text and at the end also uh is this clear is this document clear yes the document is clear but i have a few questions yeah sure yes for the presentation did you say it's mm -hmm. 15 minutes or it's 15 slides no it's 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 15 minutes so okay. we'll say that your yeah this is there yeah so the reason why i said 15 slides is because i sometimes i calculate my slide as per minute so this is why i said but it can be longer than so if you have very succinct bullet points uh very just a one liner uh or you have um obviously um a slide that obviously you'll have to read through it and uh, see that whether it is a 15 minute long presentation. So obviously uh, there's a lot to cover over here in your presentation. Um, sometimes all you can do is, or the, the best thing that you can do is have speaker notes um, available. So just give bullet points in order to include everything there and not just, um, having long text, which is which is not recommended obviously, in any presentation um, uh, because you're obviously, you'll have your speaker notes to give more evidence and elaboration to your points. Mm, is yes. that okay? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. your, any other question? Yes. The presentation, how is it meant to be presented? Is it meant to be um, a PowerPoint? Are you meant to record yourself or is it something that you can do and you speak and you do a voiceover for? No, so it's, uh, you're going to just submit that presentation. You're just going to, uh, obviously you're going to rehearse that presentation. Uh, I'll have to get back to them and ask them if they would be assessing you on that. Uh, that you will uh, give it obviously on uh, through Zoom, but uh, most likely it is um, something that you will have to submit. Yes, uh, is it submitted live as, and, as a video? Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll get back to you on that. Uh, that's a good point. I just noted that down because it says it's a delivery and a submission. So I'll the submission is there definitely, uh, but I'll just make sure um, that I'm. Um, I get you clear on uh, whether you deliver that and what's the mode of delivery. Okay, thank you. Because I wanted mm -hmm. to ask, um, because I've done um, a presentation before, but it's like you either have to be in person or you have to record yourself um, um, a video of mm -hmm. yourself doing the presentation, like mm -hmm. you'll be standing next to the presentation going on. Or is it something that you can do it like um, a PowerPoint but you give voice mm -hmm. over over what's going on. That's mm -hmm. why I was asking. Yeah, 
No, that's um, that's a very good question. I'll just uh, make sure um, what's the mode of delivery. And the submission is there. Just uh, the best thing you can do is just prepare your presentation file. I'll get back to you um, probably today only and uh, after this presentation is over. And um, I'll let you know what's the mode of delivery. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And um, You're I'll, welcome. I'd also like to go over the theories of change, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Just a minute, I'll just stop sharing this. Yeah, I just had to open the screen for a minute. Um, uh, I had a question, Samuel. Um, if it's okay, uh, like um, obviously this is uh, going to be a, uh, an extended session. Uh, is it um, okay that we put the whole thing today, um, including some breaks, or would you want it tomorrow as well? I, I don't have an issue uh, in doing it today or tomorrow. Um, I think we should do it today, yes. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so the first learning objective, if I share it with you. So, uh, so yeah, it's understanding the perspectives of quality in health and social care services. Uh, I hope my screen is visible to you. So this is the first thing that we'll talk about. So this is the unit's aim. Uh, it's to develop an understanding of theories of change management, how they apply to different organizations. So I'm not going to go in too much of depth for this, um, just a bit about uh, an overview of what uh, the different, uh, whatever the content is there um, on these slides, and just quickly go through them. So we'll talk about uh, stakeholder management, different definitions that are there for stakeholders. Uh, you have different, uh, so, uh, different types of stakeholders, and are we talking about different stakeholders? Because they, when you're bringing about change, their analysis, you need to analyze them. And uh, you once you analyze them, you will understand um, there are certain stakeholders who will ha obviously resist that change. There's a four and nine sector stakeholder table, synergy and antagonist analysis. So a bit about what key terminologies we have. So uh, we talked about what are the main four quality components in um, health and social care. So we've talked about uh, these, which are safety, effectiveness, person-centeredness, or patient-centeredness, timeliness, equity, efficiency. Uh, yeah, we talked about what equity and equality, what the differences are. Uh, some key perspectives from uh, different stakeholders. So there's health uh, service staff perspective, uh, who obviously they have a, a very important role in delivering uh, care, and that's a day-to-day -day work for them. Uh, so their perspectives would in, uh, involve ensuring safety, effectiveness, overall quality improvement in their daily tasks. Then their patient perspectives, I, I talked a bit about what their perspectives are, they see ex their, uh, their experience as a yardstick to see um, that how satisfied they are, what yardsticks do they have, and how are those yardsticks, how do they have those yardsticks? Um, like, is it something that they've researched, or is it some other organization or some other, um, uh, uh, some other healthcare provider that they've just um, uh, been through? due to which they have these certain yardsticks or they have these certain um, ways of assessing um, the quality of your organization or any other organization. Effectiveness, is it effectiveness of treatment that they have received? So what are the, their main perspectives? So I might say that for me, it's um, experience. So for instance, in experience, you have several other things also. It's the timeliness, it's the 
obviously the waiting lists or the wait um the way it it can be as small as how someone spoke to that patient to as big as uh how did the surgery work for them uh, how uh, how uh what was their expectation that how early would they be um let's say how uh, how well will they be recovered so these obviously patients do a lot of research also they've uh, they've not come just um, as a free mind um, they have their researched backing and they understand what is going on in this uh, in different organizations so how do you meet how you best meet their expectations and this is crucial for healthcare quality stakeholders. So different stakeholders, their regulators, their policy makers, funding bodies. Funding bodies are main stakeholders, obviously, in uh, organization. <clears throat> so there are certain meet, uh, stakeholders uh, that regulatory standards that have to be achieved. So what are stakeholders? Stakeholders uh, who will come and uh, they'll be external stakeholders, obviously, and they'll come and assess uh, your quality control measures, um, and then they will give you certain suggestions. So it is always recommended that you have some internal stakeholders <clears throat> or internal quality meetings or internal quality audits before there is an external audit, uh, just so that you're on track and you know that your organization uh, is um, up to date and you can that is why stakeholder analysis is so important. So what are the stakeholders looking at? What are they wanting to achieve, wanting you to achieve? So when you have your internal audits working well, you can work with them. So, um, and obviously, then there's the yeah, perspective. So there's research, there's improving healthcare policies, uh, improving. So your main ultimate goal is to improve the quality of services. Uh, so in UK University, uh, it's an academic institution. You have uh, uh, courses that you offer uh, related to this field and you're contributing to the understanding of quality in healthcare. So this is what we're doing. We are striving and uh, how, uh, what are, we have different stakeholders as well. You students, learners are uh, an important stakeholder. And we understand that uh, if we bring about a change, let's say, if we, if we move from uh, having Zoom classes and then we go and have face-to-face, -face, what resistance would there be? What barriers would there be? So if we know that beforehand, that's not that, okay. Some people have an expert opinion because they've worked for years, for decades, they've worked in the, the organization. They know what the pros and cons are. But then again, this has to be researched, well-researched, backed by research, unless th th that is there, you cannot bring about the quality that you're expecting uh, to be there. Then the overall uh, framework, uh, obviously, this is a comprehensive perspective of quality in health and social care services. And it has uh, all the components that we talked about, these factors collectively define the quality of care provided. So if you understand, if you have an understanding of quality in health and social care services, you know that there are multiple stakeholders, multiple perspectives. So uh, perspectives of good quality care. So there's the service users perspective. We've talked about this. Uh, we've talked about um, how do Hello? Yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. So, yeah, I was just talking about service users just a minute. Yeah, start sharing this again with you. So, yeah, so service users or care users perspective. So, there are different um, ways we define them. Obviously, for us, uh, they'll be the students, they'll be the patients. Uh, so there's satisfaction levels that uh, we have. So we can have different questionnaires that we have uh, to assess the quality of our system. We can have uh, different um, ways to assess, obviously, um, uh, some people 
um, for instance, I get an SMS of uh, sharing my views about um, a, a particular surgery that I've just attended. Um, and then I give my views and then you can also go and, uh, and ask. Um, so you're not leaving it there. So if there's a person who's uh, not satisfied, you're actually asking them what is the reason of not being satisfied. And then you publish this thing. So the reason, and you obviously there's an uh, that uh, component of confidentiality. Uh, so if the patient is not um, uh, is not liking you sharing their your their comments or their um, uh, what their expectations were or their uh, feedback, you would obviously you would obviously ask them your their informed consent should be there. This is again. You, what is the role of all of this? This is to achieve uh, quality care uh, throughout the system. So, um, and then users, they have an important, uh, this this is, the, um, they're an important um, stakeholder that you have to consider. And you have to consider the different ways in which obviously you'll gather feedback. So for me, maybe a written feedback would not help me or would not be, I would not like it much, just uh, tapping on my phone would be easier for me. So um, obviously uh, this is an important uh, factor and this is not the only factor. So, <clears throat> so when you're talking about care providers views, you talk a focus on the user or the patient, you talk about safety, whether the patient uh, felt safe within the premises, <clears throat> whether there was any hazard that they identified or, or did you identify any hazard uh, during diagnostic or therapeutic procedures? Effic efficacy is how, uh, and so your the healthcare that you're providing uh, is it, how appropriate is it for the patient? So you're giving a therapeutic intervention and has it achieved its uh, the health goals? Timeliness again, is obviously not letting them wait for uh, unnecessarily. If there is a waiting, they should be aware of it. There should be um, uh, proper guide guidance to uh, if there is a waiting and they should be um, aware of the increased load that the healthcare uh, has to deal with. Um, fairness again, equal access. We talk about um, unequal access. We talk about this is because it's been researched so much um, about um, uh, the ethnic minorities, um, uh, the religious minorities, so the socioeconomic minority groups. So they're there because they've been well researched before. So what we have to do, we have to bring about a change so that there is fairness, there is more timeliness, there is more efficacy and safety and there is a focus on the user or the patient now, which will bring about change in um, and quality in this, uh, in the organization. Care managers' uh, views. So obviously, their views are very important. We can take them uh, in the form of feedback. We can take them um, as satisfaction, how satisfied they are. Um, yeah, and. You can watch this video later on. It is basically about um, health, quality, and safety. Uh, so we talked about um, uh, what uh, is meant by quality and how we how do we assess. So we're talking about uh, stakeholder roles uh, in with regards to quality and standards in health and social care settings. So they're different. Um, Stakeholders, patients, and service users, we tend to use them um, syn synonymously. So they are the primary consumers of health care and social care services. Their responsibility is obviously to provide accurate information and feedback on the services. Uh, sometimes it might not be so accurate. Sometimes it may be biased. So you'll have to have those barriers also. Uh, so let's say I do not like a particular uh, GP, and I will then... Uh, give a bad feedback for the entire organization, but that shouldn't be in this way. So when you're taking some feedback, it should be broken down into, you should have a further analysis of it uh, so that there um, is a further explanation of why that experience was not as it had to be. Um, so it might be just that GP who's responsible for not delivering 
quality care and it's not the whole organization. So that can be sorted. So this is some this is an important um, factor that needs to be understood within the barriers. Healthcare professionals. So there are different healthcare professionals that we have. Their their responsibility is to uh, deliver services, and this is again according to the guidelines, clinical governance, and best practices. Uh, regular regular there are different stakeholders who are regulatory bodies. There's Care Quality Commission, which will be used in multiple. Uh, uh, documents, uh, you will have to be referring this as well um, because um, this is one of the main um, organizations who, uh, who are responsible for doing external audits and they inspect, regulate and license health care and social care providers. And they are the ones, the main ones who uh, set up uh, monitoring quality standards. It's a good practice to go and look uh, how they work, how they, obviously they have several other stakeholders. So what are their guidelines that they follow for quality um, healthcare and um, what, how do they assess their barriers? And um, so obviously if you're uh, having a look and you're analyzing uh, what the main people who are the main organization that make these guidelines, uh, you're understanding them. Uh, this is a way of understanding how you would bring about change, obviously. Uh, then the government and policy makers, uh, obviously, who make uh, public health policies, responsibilities uh, they have are to allocate resources, formulate regulations, enact laws. Then there are NGOs, several non-government organizations. Uh, so they offer specialized services and advocacy. Uh, to fill in gaps in services, raise awareness. Uh, so they do what um, uh, the government organizations don't do. They are the ones who fill in the gaps. There are certain peers, so funding bodies that you have as stakeholders and they have limited resources. Obviously, you understand that and they want you to understand that better so that whatever your resources that you have, you're going to justify them, obviously. Uh, so there's um, a summary that goes out um, and what uh, what you've done and uh, wh whatever uh, processes have been implemented or are in place or whatever new processes or new changes that are, you're bringing about and how much funding do you require and you have to justify all of them. Then you have the academic and research institutions who are uh, who offer training, conduct research uh, to bring about uh, uh, evidence-based recommendations because these recommendations change on a regular basis. So you have to have these institutions there working to uh, highlight those changes and publish them and uh, make sure that they reach the, the people who are most concerned or the organizations who are most concerned with these changes, communities and families. So they're again, immediate, immediate support network for the patients. So if you're, uh, if you're giving them autonomy and you're giving them, uh, you're keeping them also at the center of the care, this gives them autonomy, this gives them confidence. Um, I was just, um, I attended a, a clinic where there was a cardiologist um, who actually spoke the language that the patient had. And that, um, brought about a further ease in that patient's, um, obviously it was a cardiologist so that these visits are not very good. Uh, they're full of anxiety. Uh, but then when you're using certain, su such small things, um, so as you're improving quality in a way, so it doesn't have to be very big, it can be as small as just using um, the same language, just a phrase from the same language to show that, um, that warmth and that empathy. So this improves quality as well. Interconnected roles, so different stakeholders are interconnected, as I said, uh, and the interconnectedness is vast. It can't be just that if you have stakeholders, uh, that's it. No, those stakeholders have other stakeholders uh, do, which guides them and um, makes drives them towards um, the change. So stakeholder engagement is very important uh, in conclusion and explore the role of external agencies. We've talked about this, so different roles. Um, so let's say you have uh, regulatory bodies, you have the CQC, as I mentioned earlier, this is to inspect and assess performance of healthcare and social care providers. 
uh, they conduct regular inspections, so they'll do external audits and they'll give you licenses or cancel them if the, if the working is not there. Uh, and then their accreditation bodies, Joint Commission International, JCI, they evaluate healthcare organizations and they have benchmarks al al already against which they um, give you, uh, again, they license you to work or um, uh, offer accreditation to healthcare organizations um, or, they, or they don't give the accreditation. Then there are professional bo bodies um, or associations. So you have the BMA, British Medical Association, you have Royal College of Nursing, uh, you ha they uh, they show interests of professionals in health and social care sector. So they offer training, set ethical guidelines, which change tremendously, uh, advocate for policies. And then you have different um, uh, public health agencies. So you have Public Health England. This is to protect and improve the public health, conduct research, and give guidelines. You have department uh, departments that work within the government, so Department of Health and Social Care, DHSC in the UK. So they're obviously formulating policies, allocating resources. So most of them, these organizations work as, uh, have similar, um, um, they work in similar ways, but they work on uh, different aspects of quality care. So their main uh, goal is obviously um, improving quality. Then you have certain uh, non-government organizations. For instance, you have Age UK, you have Mind. They focus on healthcare needs and issues, and they conduct uh, researches. They fill in the gaps uh, within the healthcare research, uh, within the healthcare system. And then you have research and academic institutions. You have in, uh, interagency co collaborations also. So we've talked about these. Uh, a bit about uh, all of these, basically. And um, so the impact of quality and standards on health and social care, there may be obviously uh, clinical outcomes that you have to assess. There's mortality, medical errors, morbidity. So you have different um, uh, charts that tell you what, uh, how many. Uh, so if you go to a hospital, they'll tell you, uh, there'll be a chart that says how many people came to the hospital and how many people were discharged and uh, free of morbidity or their morbidity or whatever their condition was, it was clinically managed and how many of them did not make it and um, the, as a result of mortality. Medical errors, they have to be there misdiagnosis, wrong medication, incorrect treatment. This is very important. There should be, um, um, uh, obviously, um, regular meetings that these are not to penalize anyone, uh, not to focus on someone's uh, whatever they've done wrong, but to focus on improving quality, obviously. So this should be in... Uh, or this should be there always. Then there are financial consequences in which you have increased costs, obviously uh, poor quality. It's um, It results from readmissions, additional treatments. This escalates healthcare costs. So obviously your resources, they're always going to be limited. There's going to be an inner resource drain. So if you're giving um, a certain medication to someone who doesn't require it, that's a resource drain again. So resources have to be directed where they are required the most. Psychological effects are again, loss of trust from any um, any stakeholder. So this is uh, when quality is not achieved and uh, emotional distress obviously for from the stakeholders also. Then there are certain legal and ethical applic uh, implications. So there's certain lawsuits because of malpractice. This is very evident in itself, whatever is written. Um, there's some ethical dilemmas in which confidentiality, for instance, was uh, breached or any other um, unethical um, practice that could lead to um, certain implications. There's certain uh, systemic effects. Uh, so re the reputation of that organization could be jeopardized um, and then uh, obviously there are different factors that would be influenced because of that. There'll be less of uh, staff working there. You'll be working with staff, but that's poor quality. You'll be having funding issues. 
policy challenges. So if you have consistent failures in maintaining quality, it will lead to more uh, uh, stringent regulations and it will be challenging for healthcare providers to operate uh, within that system. It will have a social impact also. So if there's inequality, uh, we talked about equity and equality. So you have vulnerable populations and um, if uh, obviously you don't have the standards that you're adhering to, uh, those vulnerable populations who were um, already um, at risk and who uh, were already not receiving the care that uh, the not so vulnerable population was receiving, um, this then brings about further inequality um, within the healthcare system. Public health risks, we know, um, there's spread of infections if there's no proper, if there's not proper pol um, policies for uh, improving quality. So, um, yeah, so we've talked about this. Then, analyzing methods for evaluating health and social care quality of. Uh, the uh, quality of service provision. So you have several uh, ways of um, assessing quality. So this is in the form of audits. Uh, you have internal audits and you have external audits. The advantages are that it identifies gaps and opportunities to improvement, but it is time consuming. And uh, it sometimes it finds more faults than uh, focusing on the positive things that have happened. Uh, patient satisfaction surveys, they're very good. So when you analyze them, the questionnaires that you can uh, help, uh, that patients can help and they'll, they'll, they can fill them and then it says how satisfied they are. The advantage is that it gives direct feedback. It can be subjective and biased if it's not accurately reflecting the quality of cl clinical care. So patients, they have their own uh, views, uh, their own mind setup that they come with and this can influence their the satisfaction surveys. Uh, performance indicators, so quantifiable measures like readmission rates, waiting times. Again, you can have these indicators there. Infection rates, advantages is that it's objective. It's not subjective. It's easy to track over time. Gives you numbers. It may not cover all aspects of quality, such as patient experience, because it is more objective. So this is why. Peer reviews, obviously, they're very uh, helpful. Mm in which you have your professionals, your uh, your leaders, for instance, they give you reviews or they have, um, they uh, evaluate uh, your, the, your system uh, against certain standards. They provide expert insights into clinical practice, but then again, they may have, be biased also. Accreditation and certification, we've talked about this. This validates quality measures, can be a mark of excellence. However, it may be costly and time intensive. Incident reporting, you might have several incident reportings. These help in identifying the issues that are there in the system and prevent future errors, but they uh, sometimes they're often uh, underutilized. Again, in, in order not to be blamed and not to bring about um, being focused uh, for that um, particular uh, fault that happened. Uh, comparative studies, uh, again, using research and comparison, uh, com uh, making comparisons. As I said, some certain uh, organizations such as uh, CQC, their studies can be used in which, uh, how did they use their quality measures and how did they bring about changes? What uh, barriers did they find? Qualitative interviews are very important. Uh, these are in-depth interviews uh, from families and uh, certain other stakeholders. These provide rich contextual data, but they are time consuming and can not be generalized to the larger population. So this is um, a summary of what we've talked about. Um, there are certain other organizations also, uh, the, the WHO uh, framework, NHS, England, uh, England's evaluation framework and quality care, uh, care quality commission uh, analysis. So these are all there to provide uh, quality care. So we've done with this presentation. I'll quickly go through the second LO. Uh, is there any question that you have? Um, no, it was very clear. Thank you. Mm, that's okay. I just have to rush through certain things because um, obviously uh, they're five uh, based, yeah, there are five presentations that 
um, I will be covering with you, which should be, uh, we should be done in time because um, obviously it's a summary that I'm giving you. So any questions that you have in between, please let me know. So this is the second uh, learning objective. Do you need a break? I'm okay. Oh, no, I don't... No. I'm fine. Okay. I'm fine. Yeah, that's fine. So leading change in health and social care. This is uh, the second learning objective, understanding the strategies for achieving quality in health and social care services. So you have certain, um, uh, obviously certain organizations, you have NICE guidelines, you have the King's Fund, that's an independent think tank that's involved with work relating to health, uh, the health system within England. Quality measurement frameworks are there and factors affecting quality of care, quality improvement in health and social care. So there are certain key terminologies uh, quality in health and social care services. This is uh, obviously it's of paramount importance. That is what our whole uh, topic is about. Our whole unit is about that we're bringing about quality in whatever we are doing. Um, so whether big or small, we need it to be not or we're not satisfying uh, with quantity. We are satisfying with quality instead. Uh, so there are several strategies that have been developed and implemented in order to achieve quality and maintain high quality services. We'll talk about these. So there are certain regulatory frameworks. We've talked about these. For instance, in the UK, you have CQ, the CQC plays a pivotal role in regulating and inspecting, uh, and it gives its reports and further changes uh, that are expected in a timeline, um, and then they come back and um, assess again. The second is continuous quality improvement. So as the name suggests, it's continuous. So it's uh, implementing a continuous methodology. So you have plan, do, study, and act. Um, this is a cycle. So you plan something. So for instance, if you're implementing some change um, and that plan is then shared with all the stakeholders, you're then uh, bringing about that change. And then you're reflecting on what went right, what went wrong, uh, so that uh, that exercise that you did um, on uh, bringing about that change, you'll then do it uh, on a bigger scale, or you'll do it more. Um, you'll do it in a more finalized way once you study what happened right and one what happened wrong. So sometimes these are done in the form of certain pilot studies. Uh, so you're planning something and then you don't know how does it work um, or what thing that you planned. So you do a little pilot study and then you see what the consequences were and then you act according to them so to bring about quality or the change that you're expecting. These help organizations continuously assessing uh, and improving their services and uh, they talk, uh, they see any loopholes that are there and rectify them promptly and then bring about that change uh, in when they're acting. Patient and service user involvement. We've talked about this. This is very crucial. So if you want patient-centered care, this would then in, in, allow for feedback, but you know that feedback can be biased also. So you have that bias uh, component also. Training and development. This is on a regular basis, obviously. You have CPDs, regular uh, uh, it's uh, continuous professional development. You have um, uh, certain research bodies that are there. Uh, and this is important so that you have people who have good quality training and you're only using them for uh, providing the best of care. Uh, then you have integration of uh, IT. Uh, so without IT, obviously we can't work. Uh, the new hype now is about uh, using or not using AI. So obviously AI has artificial intelligence, has its own uh, pros and cons, but overall if there is a change and that change is bringing quality, you would not Though um, obviously uh, you're opposing uh, you're opposing that change uh, so that humans can still be working in the industry. But if they, if there's something that can work better than humans, then that change has to be brought about. But you'll have different stakeholders that will be having different push and pull factors there. Uh, so you'll have to have uh, an understanding of them. Evidence-based practice is very important. That's why we have all of these research bodies working there to bring the best of evidence 
uh, that we have. That is why we have systematic reviews and we have meta analysis to show that these things has, have worked and these things have not worked and they should not be um, used in, few, in the future. So performance monitoring and key performance indicators, KPI, these regularly uh, monitor the performance. Uh, uh, so you have uh, certain indicators that are there. These allow organizations to track progress and um, identify the areas that require attention. So all the gaps are then identified and then uh, there, uh, the, you, uh, every organization has their own key performance indicators. So uh, based on their um, whatever quality standards are. So uh, you'll be assessing these against certain yardsticks. Interdisciplinary collaboration, obviously different stakeholders that will be collaborating in different ways. Um, achieving quality in health and social care requires multi of uh, multifaceted approach because it is multifaceted. So because it has multiple stakeholders, it has multiple um, uh, it has multiple barriers. So you're working on uh, on an understanding of all these multifaceted approaches that can work for different components. Uh, you have your patient involvement, you have uh, staff training, all of these that we've talked about earlier. <clears throat> We can talk about, we can have a look when, if we have the time, so uh, this video. So nice guidelines, uh, uh, <clears throat> this is a way in which quality can be measured. So the different ways, so NICE uh, has its clinical guidelines that are, they are again, evidence-based clinical guidelines. You can always Google them up and they're very reliable sources which you can uh, make use of and because they've been well researched. So that is why they're re very reliable. And um, they obviously ha have information extracted from uh, several years of effort and uh, systematic reviews or meta-analysis that have been done on wide ranged uh, populations so that they become generalizable also. Uh, so this they give uh, uh, they specify they give guidelines you know, for appropriate treatments uh, for setting certain other standards. Uh, so there's a high a wide range of uh, quality uh, components that they focus on. Performance indicators are very important. Quality in health and social care it is um, uh, measured through performance indicators. So you have different performance indicators we've talked about earlier. You have different waiting times, infection rates, patient satisfaction scores, you can use make, make use of all of them. Patient reported outcome measures can also be used, which are known as PROMS. So this, this is related to quality of life, outcome of care from the patient's perspectives. Um, NICE uh, can recommend this, uh, the use of PROMS uh, in order to measure effectiveness of treatment and intervention. Then you have clinical audits, you can have internal clinical audits, you can have external clinical audits also. So the mean, they're basically they're um, they're just improving quality uh, and measuring what changes are required, assessing what changes are required. Peer reviewing and benchmarking. We've talked about this earlier. So you have different peers that have their reviews and they have their uh, setting standards, and then they uh, help you bringing about uh, achieving those standards. Patient and public involvement, important stakeholders, obviously their experiences and satisfaction, they're taken through surveys and consultations. Then you have cost effectiveness analysis. So uh, whatever you've used, whatever resources you've used, are they cost effective? Um, uh, have they made an impact <laughs> within the limited resources or would they uh, would you have to bring about a change in uh, any part, um, any uh, aspect of them in order to improve quality so um, yeah so this is against a certain uh, amount of resources how effective have those resources worked how effective have they um, how have they benefited um, a certain population so uh, measuring quality in health and social care, uh, it involves uh, a comprehensive approach. You'll have different ways in which you have different indicators to measure quality. So, and NICE is uh, one uh, organization that plays a central role in providing guidelines and recommendations. So you have uh, these resources for this uh, objective. Then you have uh, approaches that you evaluate to implementing quality systems. So you have the first approach that uh, I'll talk about is total quality management. We've talked about this earlier a bit, but it's a comprehensive approach and it emphasizes on continuous improvement, CQI, continuous quality improvement. 
and it has a customer focus, a patient focus in uh, in any instance, uh, and, uh, a student focus, let's say in my instance, uh, and it has employee uh, involvement. So there are three important factors that it has, uh, that it uh, is heavily focused on. So it's continuous improvement, customer focus and employee involvement. So it's widely used in healthcare, uh, and it's obviously um, uh, to, there to improve uh, processes and patient care. Total quality management it can be effective in enhancing quality, but it requires a significant cultural shift and long-term commitment. So sometimes organizations do not use this because it's a long-term commitment, and if they have that in place, this is wonderful to use. Six Sigma, it's data-driven. Uh, it's aimed at reducing defects and errors in processes, and it is applied in healthcare uh, in order to enhance quality, reduce medical errors. Uh, it can lead to significant improvements. However, you need extensive training on it and a lot of resource that you need to allocate on it. Um, so this, uh, again, is one very important uh, way of assessing quality. You have lean management. So their principles, uh, their focus on eliminating waste, improving efficiency in the processes. So these lean methodologies, they can reduce waiting times, improve patient flow. Uh, again, however, you would uh, need significant changes in workflow and culture. The ISO standards, we are aware of these uh, ISO uh, standards. So if you have a certificate, a valid certificate that in that instance, uh, this is how quality is, uh, uh, it reflects that you have the proper quality system working. Uh, then you have Wallridge um, Performance Excellence Framework. So this framework provides a structured approach to organizational excellence. Uh, you have the components of self-assessment, benchmarking, continuous improvement, and uh, there are several organizations in healthcare that have adopted this framework uh, and Im to improve quality. You have regulatory compliance, so you have the NICE guidelines, for instance. You have the patient-centered approaches. Uh, you have uh, their decisions and treatment plans that are in focus. Uh, uh, so there's no yardstick for this, but this is just something that is there in your everyday work. Um, so you have improved communication skills. You have different CPDs um, uh, to improve communication skills of your workforce and provide a patient-friendly atmosphere. Continuous feedback and improvement. Again, feedback from all the stakeholders is very important, but feedback particularly from uh, your immediate stakeholders, which are your employees uh, and your uh, managers and obviously your patients who come first. So uh, the choice, there are different choices uh, that you have to uh, uh, when you want to implement quality. Uh, so each approach has different strengths and uh, limitations. We've talked about these earlier. And these are some of the references if you would want to uh, uh, have a look at. Then we are analyzing barriers. So as we know, we've uh, talked a bit about the different barriers because uh, stakeholders, they are um, they have complex connections and they're multifaceted in their uh, in the uh, in uh, the roles that they have. So obviously, there are different barriers also. So resource constraints, their limited financial resources, their staffing shortages, these then obviously uh, reflect in your quality that you stand, uh, set up um, if you have in, uh, insufficient funding. Obviously, funding, uh, if it's, uh, you have to allocate the resources in a very smart way and because resources are never going to be enough. Uh, but sometimes uh, there's, so less the resources that even if you do it the smartest way, they're still going to be reflected. Uh, so that has to be taken care of. Um, and then you have uh, resources that are several in nature. So it's not just the money that I'm talking about. It's it's the uh, it's the workforce. It's the time that is being used. It's the material that is being used. So all of these are. Uh, examples of resources. Workforce challenges, so barriers like um, uh, staff burnout, high turnover rates, people become, uh, get trained and they leave the organization, that's really bad. So there has to be some reason for them to stick uh, in your organization. Being happy is very important. 
being satisfied for this stakeholder also difficulties in recruitment so you might not have a very good pay scale for them not very good uh, cpd uh, opportunities for them uh, not very good packages for them so then you have difficulties in recruitment um fragmented care so this is because of poor collaboration poor co coordination between different uh, healthcare providers and services uh, so these then uh, these are very evident to the patient and uh, they then receive not proper care and it's just a duplication of efforts that they receive and it's a waste of resources uh, which would then impact their overall experience and um, outcomes health inequalities we've talked about vulnerable populations how they face barriers and if this um, there's further deterioration in the quality of the system that, that's working there this gives further inequalities or uh, uh, rises further inequalities lack of information sharing it's very important to inform uh, to share information on a regular basis with all the stakeholders and the amount that has to be shared or whoever needs to have that information that should be taken care of so this leads to errors delays in treatment compromised patient safety uh, regulatory burden so there are excessive um, administrative and regulatory requirements and these can be uh, diverting uh, resources away from patient and you have an increased administrative burden for instance on healthcare providers so this can negatively impact the quality of care resistance to change several organizations might not want to uh, uh, go about with the change that you want but if that change is justified and uh, is well researched then obviously uh, things can be planned in that way in different ways uh, so uh, obviously you're not all stakeholders will always be happy with uh, different changes that are made uh, complex healthcare systems. So we know that there are different uh, complexities within stakeholders. So that health system is also complex in that way. Um, this, if there's increase increased complexity, so the patients they don't, they don't they don't know what the reason for the delay is. What uh, they have they consider is uh, it as an inefficient system, and the the feedback is again yeah, given in the same way. Inadequate patient engagement. So <clears throat> the patient, if they've not been patient sent, if the if the treatment or the plan is not patient-centered, it then gives a misunderstanding and uh, affects the overall quality uh, in terms of their feedback that you receive. Uh, public health emergencies, they're always going to be the threat of pandemics. Uh, and then all whatever you've planned, that's, been going, that's going to be disrupted. And uh, there's certain uh, things that will be surfaced, certain things that will be resurfaced, certain things that will be going back um, to square one so you can never predict what uh, public health emergencies can do so addressing these barriers uh, when you're uh, uh, talking about quality health and social care services it's, it requires a multifaceted approach so you're working with policymakers and different stakeholders and your main objective is to improve the quality of the system uh, these are the references if you would want to look at them um, and that's about it from this uh, this PowerPoint. Uh, is this clear? Yes, it's very clear. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, so we have half an hour still, um, and I'm trying that if uh, within this half an hour, we can quickly just skim through these uh, remaining slides. Thank you. So that's okay. So the third uh, learning objective, I'll share it with you now. So this is leading change in health and social care. We are trying to understand the uh, learning objective is to understand the principles of change management. So there are different uh, principles that um, you have in place that are there uh, to bring about change. So obviously, as I said, when you're uh, talking about change, that change has to be managed. Uh, it has to be sustainable also. Uh, so how do you, uh, what are the principles that um, address these factors? So there are certain factors that uh, have to be analyzed. Um, these are there to drive change, that drive changes and are essential for understanding the forces that lead to shifts in health and uh, healthcare and social care settings. 
So they'll be internal and external. They have an impact, a significant impact on the need for change. Um, so they be, uh, we'll talk about these various factors. So there's certain internal factors, there's certain external factors. So the internal factors are quality improvement initiatives. So your healthcare organization, they might see that there is some, there are some uh, problems uh, within uh, the system. So they'll have internal audits, for instance. They want to reduce errors. They want to enhance patient safety. So these come to uh, through internal audits, and in, through, um, this is uh, uh, that give you quality improvement initiatives. Um, so you want your basic uh, goal is to improve the quality. Um, so they're different. Uh, you can take them uh, one at a time or you can take them all together, but they're very small uh, changes that you want to make. And if these changes are on a regular basis, then changes within organizations. Financial pressures. So these are the major internal factors that are uh, responsible for um, uh, managing change. So you've had certain resources and you've brought about a change. How would you manage these on a regular basis? So obviously, if you have the barrier in mind, you would want a thing. You would want something that is running on a regular basis instead of just a one-off thing. So this should be there in place. Um, technological advancement. So obviously, uh, people uh, they're obviously attracted towards technology. Hello? Yeah, hi. Seems we disconnected. Oh yeah. I just I'll just share it again with you. Okay, so um uh, yeah. So this is Quality improved initiative. We talked about the system in my audacious. Um, uh, technology ad advancements, uh, they're uh, there and they attract people, obviously. So you're not working so hard in maintaining records that are uh, paper driven. So you're working towards telemedicine, medical devices that can prompt changes in healthcare delivery um, to incorporate these advancements and improve patient care staff and workforce factors. Uh, staff shortages that should be there in your mind, skill gaps, uh, staff turnover is very important. So you're not uh, uh, having this um, uh, this consideration that the staff that you're training and you're using so much efforts in training them and you're putting in so much resources, they'll stay with you forever. No, that's not going to happen. You're going to, what's the reason? Uh, so you, if you have this internal factor that's going to uh, hamper your, quality, what are you going to offer to that staff? What are you going to offer in terms of technological advancements, financial? So if you have these things in mind, if you have these things in focus, you're then going to work upon what if this happens? Uh, so you're not going to let the system suffer. You're going to actually work upon it. Data, quality data and feedback. So internal quality or uh, internal data on clinical outcomes, patient satisfaction, performance indicators, they can uh, drive changes and they highlight that this is how they do it is by highlighting areas that require improvement. So you have internal and external audits. Coming towards the external one, regulatory changes. We have talked about regulatory bodies, accreditation bodies, health authorities that are there again to meet new requirements. So they're not there to just close down your organization. They're there to focus on what went right, what did not go right, and how to bring about uh, a change and how to support that change. Uh, technological advancements, these are again external. We had talked about internal ones. So um, again, bringing about change in uh, terms of healthcare, uh, development of new medications, for instance, or medical devices that may require changes in treatment protocols. These should be um, if they're there uh, and they're uh, improving the quality, you should act very well accept them. For population demographics, they change uh, on a regular basis. So we have 
um, an aging population and there's a change in disease prevalence. So as I talked about COVID-19, that uh, when that happened, you had a mental, uh, you had mental health, uh, mental disorders that resurfaced and you were not expecting this to happen. And this was not the case when it happened before COVID. And uh, it ha happened only when COVID uh, cases that were being more stabilized. So you were not focusing only on deaths. Now you were focusing on other conditions also. So this is where you started seeing that the different changes that are happening and different. Um, this is one important factor and external factor that is there that you have to have focus on uh, healthcare economics. So economics, again, as, as I said, uh, funding changes, insurance policies, changes, reimbursement rates change. So you have to have a proper view of how these economies are working, how your funding is going to be uh, un is not going to hamper your services. Uh, emerging health threats, again, in the form of different pandemics, patient expectations and advocacy. So awareness is very crucial for patients um, to be aware of what their uh, what the plans are. Uh, you have to have this um, patient-centered care to improve quality overall. Global health trends, they need uh, in order to be in your practice. Uh, you are focusing on preventing using health care disparities, promoting health equity. Uh, if that's the global trend, that is what you will have to follow. So this, we talked about these different factors that in quality of care that we provide. These are some of the references uh, that you access. Uh, we can watch this video later on. Uh, describe the underpinning theories. Underpinning theory, sorry. So there's several theories that we can. Uh, times actually uh, we have those theories working, but we, if we uh, have uh, a proper understanding of them. Five minutes so that I just stretch my legs. That's okay. Also, okay. I'll just catch up again. Thank you. All right.
Hello? Yeah, hi, I'm back. Just a minute. Just needed a bit of water, sorry. So I'll just open up my presentation again. Just a minute. Yeah. Um, so it is important here yeah, to understand uh, these change models. So the first one we'll talk about is Levin's uh, change mod management model. So uh, Kurt Levin in 1940, um, you'll be using these models, by the way, when you're making your plans. So obviously you're not going to talk about uh, every um, different aspects of this model, but then uh, the, main, um, uh, the main model that you're using, that should be there, um, that should be informed there. So it is one of the foundational theories of change management. Again, we are focusing on how to manage change. So in this model, it consists of three stages. So there's an unfreeze stage, there's a change, and then rephrase, uh, refreeze, sorry. So unfreeze is this when the organizations decrease, create awareness about the need for change and prepare individuals and organizations for upcoming changes. Uh, and change it is implemented during this stage and there are new processes, systems or practices that are introduced. Uh, this is then again after the unfreeze phase uh, where there's a need for change and then the change it happens it's uh, on uh, uh, regarding whatever um, uh, was highlighted and then the new processes systems or practices that are introduced we consider all the factors that are there that are going to be there while implementing these changes and then after that we have the refreeze um, uh, phase in which um, or stage where after the change is implemented, the organization stabilizes and reinforces the new state of affairs. So the new changes that have been implemented, those are then going to be um, highlighted. So this model emphasizes the importance of unfreezing. So you, uh, it sees what is there, what is not there, uh, making the change and then refreezing. So this is how you're managing you're freezing whatever you um you, you got rid of what was not needed. You have a new change, and then you're again freezing those changes. Uh, so then that are uh, becoming the new norm. Uh, you have Carter's eight-step uh change model, in which uh it talks about it. Uh, it's uh, it expands upon Levin's uh model, and it's to provide a structured approach to leading change. Uh and um. So it includes eight stages. So you're creating a sense of urgency. Again, think about the three, uh, the deep, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the, the three stages of uh, Levin's model. I'll go again: unfreezing, change, and then refreezing. Freezing. So you're creating a sense sense of urgency. You're forming a powerful coalition with different stakeholders. You're creating a vision for change. 
You're communicating that vision for change to different stakeholders. You're removing obstacles. Uh, you, uh, you know what uh, obstacles there are uh, based on different uh, ways that you've uh, taken that understanding from. And uh, you create short-term wins so different assessments are carried out, different evaluations are carried out on a regular basis. And then you're building on changes and you're anchoring the changes uh, in uh, the corporate culture. So you're strengthening the corporate culture even more. So this is to develop a strong relationships, uh, strong leadership, communication, and a strategic vision for change. Then you have Prosky's ADCAR model. So ADCAR stands for awareness, so understanding the need for change, you need to make uh, people aware, you need to be aware of it yourself, uh, your desire, having the motivation to support and participate in the change. Everyone has to have that uh, awareness and that desire. The knowledge, acquiring the necessary knowledge and skills for change, ability, the, uh, the capacity to implement new behaviors, and then reinforcement is the last one. When you, where you're ensuring that the change is sustained over time. So again, whatever you are doing, whatever change you're bringing about, that should be sustained and it should be um, for a longer duration. This model is useful when you're understanding the human side of change and addressing individual resistance. Roger's diffusion of innovation. Uh, so uh, you have, and this theory explores how innovations are adopted over time, and it categorizes individuals into different groups based on their readiness to adopt changes. So obviously, there are different groups that work in different ways, and this is to see whether they are ready to adopt, because not everyone is going to be, not all stakeholders are going to be ready for change. So they're innovators, the first to adopt new ideas, early adopters, new ideas, Yes, they're more selective to, uh, obviously, the more, uh, the newer the idea is, the more selectivity you will have. Early majority, so there'll be some people who will want the change, and they'll be the early majority. So they have certain motives also behind this. And the late majority people will also have, they'll be cautious adopters, and you will, uh, once you've brought about a change, and you've brought about several changes, these cautious adopters will be highlighted, these early majorities will be highlighted, early adopters will be highlighted also, and the innovators always, always will be highlighted. And then the last ones who will resist to, to change. So there are different people who uh, behave in different ways when there is a change brought about. And when you have an understanding of where these uh, where different people fall in, or different stakeholders fall in within this, you have a better idea of understanding what's going to happen next in your next change. Uh, the complexity theory. So it's a, uh, it recognizes the healthcare organizations. They are dynamic. They are not very simple. They're not, uh, uh, they're not linear. They are uh, rather non-linear. They have multiple interacting components. Change in these settings is often predictable. Small changes can have significant outcomes. So it emphasizes, this theory emphasizes on adaptability and the need for iterative, uh, flexible approaches to change. So change will not always be rigid. It has to be flexible. Cultural change theories, many change initiatives in healthcare and social care, uh, they involve a cultural change. So you have Sheen's organizational culture, a culture model and the competing values framework that help organizations understanding their existing culture and how to shift it to support desired changes. So you're talking about cultural changes. Um, so culture is an important barrier uh, or sometimes a facilitator in the change that you're doing. Um, so these theories, they provide different lenses through which you view uh, the change in healthcare. Uh, so you have a cultural view also while you're making the changes in healthcare. Uh, so if there's successful change management, it often combines these theories with, uh, and you have a deeper understanding of the organizational uh, organization's unique challenges and culture. So uh, there are different approaches and tools and techniques that support the change process. So we'll talk about these uh, various factors. So the, uh, the approaches are uh, 
uh, various. So you have the project management approach in which you're utilizing the project management uh, methodologies like project management institutes, PMI approach, or PRINCE2 that can help the healthcare organizations plan and they can also execute changes um, systematically. So these provide uh, structures for defining your different objectives. So it's done in a project uh, project management approach uh, is done in a way a project would be managed. Any project would be managed. So you might have a Gantt chart for this and you would include risk management also for this. Lean and Six Sigma, we talked about this earlier. So these focus on processes uh, that involve improvement and reducing waste for lean um, management. These approaches can be applied to streamline healthcare processes, reduce errors and enhance quality. Agile methodology. Uh, it's used in software uh, development, increasingly applied in healthcare to manage change. It's flexible as the name uh, suggests. It's collaborative and it's iterative and it makes, um, uh, it's, it's more suitable for complex and evolving healthcare environments. So that is why it is more agile. Potter's eight step uh, model, we've talked about a bit about it. So it's a stepwise approach to change management. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it further because we've uh, mentioned it earlier. Tools and techniques, what are the tools and techniques to manage change and make it sustainable? So care management plans should be there, it should be timelines, it should be evaluation methods, communication strategies. So you have change management plans that are already there, your objectives are already there, your stakeholders are already mentioned. Uh, so that's the whole plan that you develop. Communication strategy, you need to have clear communication ways out uh, how to communicate with different stakeholders, disseminating information, resistance management. So you have res resistance coming from different organizations and how would you work on those resistances? Uh, so that management plan should be there. Training and education, different CPD um, provisions, different workshops, different simulations. Uh, so these are important to uh, have your um, uh, staff uh, well-trained and uh, satisfied. Performance uh, met metrics and uh, metrics and key KPIs, we've talked about this. So these are different guidelines that give you uh, uh, measures of how performance is being uh, addressed and how it is measured. A workflow mapping uh, is very important, which helps workflow charts. Uh, um, it, it, it shows you a map of how the work is uh, being done and how, what gaps there are. Stakeholder analysis, obviously, you have various stakeholders. Then analysis, we've talked about them earlier. So this, uh, you can have different stakeholders listed and different uh, ways in which they have their barriers and where, where they have their, uh, you have their them as facilitators and how you can work on their, um, uh, when you have them in your, um, uh, in your quality of care. Change impact assessment. So you're what you're making the change, and then you're seeing the impact. How do you assess them? So these are different ways in which you ha have this. Um, this helps in planning mitigation strategy. So you have how do you uh, see the impact of this change? Uh, you can see it through different feedback mechanisms. You can see it through different questionnaires, different surveys. There you have them here. Um, lean tools. We've talked about this earlier. Uh, you have a value st a stream mapping, you have 5S, you have root cause analysis, they're there to find out what happened wrong and how can it be improved. Technology uh, adoption tools, uh, IT implementations, you have uh, electronic health records, uh, you have these that are, you are going to implement and you're going to have them for a longer period of time. This will help you in uh, technology data management. Simulation and modeling is used very widely now in healthcare. Uh, this is a tool to help organizations understand the impacts of change before you're implementing them. Collaboration platforms are very important. So regular meetings, regular uh, uh, communication strategies, they're there um, to bring people closer to each other when you're bringing about these changes. So all these tools, they're very helpful in maintaining changes. Uh, the importance of effective change uh, management for service provision. We know how important it is, but we'll talk a bit about, um, uh, so this is to minimize disruption, 
um, obviously you're giving, uh, 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 you're in a process and you want less of disruption to happen within that process. Maintaining quality of care that is of utmost importance. Patient and service user safety is very important. That is a, an important component of care. Enhancing efficiency, effectiveness. We've talked about this cost control, cost effectiveness. We've talked about this, how resources could be allocated best. We've talked about this. Adapting to evolving needs. So healthcare, it has to be agile, as I said, uh, a model expre expressed it. So if there are different needs, if there are rising needs, you should be uh, adding to that change. Enga engagement and morale, it's very uh, unsettling sometimes for staff. So they need an active involvement. Their views should be heard. Their morals could be uh, maintained and ensuring that the staff remains committed to delivering high quality care. Compliance and accreditation, different compliance and accreditation bodies exist. So how do they work? We've talked about them. So that could be a way of um, um, uh, why these changes, are, um, a management of change is important. Innovation and technological advances. So we are always running towards innovation and technology to make our lives easier, to make our stakeholders' lives easier. This is why uh, cha managing change is so important. Alignment with organizational goals. So your organization goals are there, but how do you best align with them by bringing about change and by adhering to that change? Sustainability, if you've brought about that change, how would you make it sustainable? Patient and service user-centered care is very important. It's the core of quality. So effective change management, it's essential for maintaining continuity of care. So that is what your main focus should be without any disruptions. Uh, keep it patient-centered or client-centered while you're uh, reducing or minimizing disruptions and ensuring patient safety at all times. So this is about this presentation. Um, what I uh, suggest now, because um, uh, the two hours are complete, uh, is it possible, Samuel, for you to, uh, for me to deliver a session for you tomorrow? Yes. At the same time? Yeah. Yes, at the same time. So yes, thank you. What we can do, yeah. So we can, I can uh, help arrange a, a session con, uh, comprising of LO4 and 5. I can talk the, or, uh, to the organizes, uh, organization and then I can um, help you with that. It shouldn't be a long session. Just uh, 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock would be okay, um, I would suggest. Yes, Is that thank okay? you. That's okay, That's yes. Yeah. So just go ahead and um, I'll, I'll ask them to share these recordings with you and just uh, have a look at what we've talked about and keep your assignment brief with you uh, in front of you. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, please uh, um, just um, email on learner um, at ukversity.uk.com. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah? Thank you. Yes, thank that's you very okay. much. Yeah. yeah, that's okay. I'll see you tomorrow, same time, nine o'clock. Yes, I'll see you tomorrow. So thank you it, very much. Yeah, is it uh, is nine o'clock okay or should it be ten o'clock? Ten o'clock is more. I think okay. ten o'clock is better. Yes. That's fine. I I'll, I'll let them know. So ten to eleven, it would be. Okay. Yes, that's great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You take care, Samuel. Yes. Have a nice day. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.